Scripture this morning is from Genesis 25, verse 19. This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Paddan Aram, and sister Laban, the Aramean. I am sorry, I know that was really, 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 really poor. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife, Rebekah, became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first came out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among, among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open, open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. This is why we also call, this is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What was good is, what good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Thanks be to the Lord. Before I begin, I want to share an update. Uh, some of you uh, on our prayer chains, email and phone prayer chains, uh, received word yesterday that our longtime member and friend uh, and dear deacon Audrey Robinson is in the hospital uh, over at Harborview in Seattle with a tumor on her brain. She uh, had been experiencing some uh, confusion in recent weeks and drove herself to the hospital on Friday. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, and then they found a tumor um, on her brain, and, and that was at Harrison in Silverdale, uh, St. Michael's, excuse me. And uh, so they took her to Harborview yesterday. Dennis, our chair of our deacons, talked to her this morning, and she seems to be doing okay and just hopeful to, that they find out what the plan is, what, what they can do about this. And so she's in good spirits, and she's been, she has no pain. But so we keep her in our prayers. So let us pray for Audrey and pray for today's message. Jesus, we come to you and bring our friend Audrey before you and ask for your healing, your comfort, your circling around her as uh, she is so far from us today in, over in Seattle in the hospital. And we pray for her daughter, Sherry, as she is here to support her. And Lord, we ask that we would be a support for Audrey and Sherry in this time. And now may, the now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock 
and our Redeemer. Amen. So for the last year and a half, I have participated in what is called uh, the Kitsap Erase Coalition. Erase stands for equity, race, and community engagement. So that's a C in there instead of the usual S you might ex expect in that word. So it's individuals and organizations who gather a couple times a month on Zoom uh, to work toward race equity in Kitsap. Uh, most of my involvement has been with the faith leaders group called Breaking Bread for Racial Justice. You may remember the Truth and Reconciliation letter that was in the Kitsap Sun this August. And we are committed to lifting up the truth and injustices um, experienced by communities of color and culture, uh, marginalized communities in Kitsap County and working toward reconciliation. We have two main goals in our faith leaders group. One is to connect spiritual leaders in Kitsap with one another for support and for collective action. The second is to pray for and be a presence in the rest of the coalition to ask the spiritual questions as we feel led. And there are lots of different teams on the coalition looking at different areas of focus from governmental institutions to health systems to uh, educational systems and so on. And so we're, we encourage faith leaders to show up in those spaces and for the co full coalition meetings and to ask spiritual questions as we feel led. So we be believe, I believe, race equity work stirs up a lot of passions, <laughs> we see that, and emotions for people from anger and fury to hope and conviction. And the faith leaders in the coalition have been charged to keep asking this question. What is the spirit of this action we are proposing? Let it, what is the spirit in this space as we're talking about this? Let's check in with our bodies, <laughs> our own spirits, as we're preparing to maybe send X, Y, or Z a letter. Right? We send these letters out to community groups or to institutions. So does this spirit come from a place of wisdom and love? Or does it, is it coming from anger or fear and just some other tangled space, right? Well, I will tell you that we are not always popular for asking those questions. And I get that. Anger and fists up kind of approach is often so much easier than unpacking the layers and coming to terms with hard truths. So one of the guiding images that has shaped me these past months um, for these moments has been our uh, next scripture lesson for today. See, the night, it was the night before Jacob is about to meet his brother Esau. Esau, you heard from Chris, uh, is the older brother, Red and Harry, that's what his name meant. And Jacob is the younger brother. And his name means uh, deceiver or heel grabber. And so he deceived his brother. He kind of tricked him out of that, that birthright with a pot of stew because he was hungry. And later, uh, they had, he tricked his dad, their dad out of the blessing. And so it's been 20 years. And the last time he saw his brother, uh, Esau wanted to kill Jacob. So he's afraid that his brother wants to do that again. And so Jacob wrestles with God by a riverbank. And the path, so on his way to reconcile with his brother, to meet his brother again, there's a wrestling match with God by a riverbank. The path toward reconciliation, friends, often takes us face to face with God. And God is ready to wrestle us to the ground and get us face to face with our own deepest self in the process. Okay, so let's look at Jacob's story. Some of the best drama and intrigue in all the Bible are these chapters, Genesis 25 to about Genesis 35. So I'll give you just sort of a quick scan. Chris introduced us to Jacob and Esau. And these are twin boys born to Isaac and Rebekah. And Esau, he's named 
uh, because of his hairiness and red face, apparently, right? And then he was, who's, who's what, who, um, was he his mom's favorite or his dad's favorite? Dad's favorite. And then Jacob, heel grabber, trickster, uh, he's mom's favorite. And so he entered the world with that name, and he kind of lived in the world with that as well. So, afraid for his life after the second time he tricked his brother, or his dad and brother, Jacob hightails it to his mom's family back up north in Padan Aram, western Mesopotamia. There he meets his match in his uncle Laban. He is like the king of deceiving and tricking. So listen to how theologian and pastor Peter N. So this is the name of the book that I'm going to read from. Genesis for Normal People. He says, Jacob continues his journey and meets his future wife, Rachel, by a well. She is Laban, so that's his, um, Jacob's uncle, Laban's youngest daughter of two. Jacob is smitten with passion, and Laban promises to let him marry her in return for seven years of work. But what's seven years of hard labor compared to getting to marry your cousin? <laughs> Jacob gladly agrees, and the time flies. On, this, on his wedding night, his bride is, is brought to his tent for usual wedding night stuff, but in the morning, he is greeted not by Rachel, but by her elder and apparently less attractive sister Leah. So maybe, ends writes, Jacob had too much of the wedding wine, or perhaps, as poetic justice, he inherited the blindness of his father Isaac. The trickster, any which way you look at it, the trickster got tricked. Jacob gets a dose of his own medicine. So the good news is that he does get to marry uh, Rachel as well, and a week later, and then he gets to promise seven more years of labor to his uncle. Yeah, that's right. And so over the course of a total of 20 years, Laban tricks and deceives Jacob over and over. But along the way, Rachel and Leah become mothers, as do two of their maidservants, by the way, by Jacob. And together with Jacob, Rachel and Leah figure out a way to get away from Laban and head home for Jacob. And so Jacob heads back home to the land and the property that he deceived his brother and dad to get. And as going home often does, some pretty big feelings started to come up for Jacob. You ever get big feelings when you return home or you see some people from home or go to, back to family? That's right. So the biggest emotion seems to be fear. Fear that his red-faced, big, hairy brother is going to kill him. And on the road home, a messenger comes to tell Jacob that Esau is on his way. And Peter ends from this book, again, writes it this way. Ask this question, will this be a reunion or a battle? Oh, the messenger adds, by the way, did I mention Esau is bringing 400 fighting men with him? If Jacob was hoping for hugs and kisses, the 400 men with Esau suggest otherwise. The squirmy mama's boy Jacob versus the mighty and hairy hunter plus 400 men, it's not looking good. So Jacob, stop us, stop us if you've heard this one, tries to manipulate the situation in his favor. He prays to God to save him, and then he sends gifts to pacify Esau. And now it's the night before he's going to see his brother, and Jacob can't sleep. Have you ever been there? The night before something and you can't sleep? All right, so we're picking this up in chapter 32. Let's go ahead there. Chapter 32, verses 22, starting in 22. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. The Jabbok is a stream, that, a river that feeds into the Jordan. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. 
And then, so just pause here for a second. Jacob has exhausted all of his tricks, and he has sent all of his people and possessions ahead of him. His plan, friends, was that if Esau came with swords ablazing, Jacob would be way at the back and back at the line, and he would have time to escape. It's a pretty great plan, huh? Yeah. Okay, so we can bring that back up. Okay, so Jacob was alone, and a man, let's see, after he'd sent them over, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, What is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Peter Enns writes this. Is this mysterious figure a vampire or just tired? This episode is puzzling. A man attacks Jacob at night, can't overpower him, yet is able to knock Jacob's hip joint out out of whack with one touch. What is happening here? But Jacob appears to know this is not just a normal fight. He tells the man he will not let go unless he blesses him. The man agrees and blesses Jacob by changing his name to Israel, which means he strives with God. And then Enns writes this. I give you this quote up up in the screens. Like their fathers of old, the Israelites are defined by their struggle with God. And like Jacob, they intend to hold on to God so that they can be blessed. So this is a story that has shaped Israel, shapes shapes the nation of Israel, that that they are a people who struggle with God, and they're going to hold on to God until God blesses them. All right, let's keep going. But Jacob replied, wait, no. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he, can we get those back up there? Is that in there? Are there any more? Nope. Okay. There we go. So I'll read this to you. Jacob said, please tell me your name. And he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. And here's my favorite part, where we get into Genesis 33. It looks like we don't have the screens for this, but let me read this to you. Genesis 33 says, Jacob looked up, and there was Esau. There we go. Coming with his 400 men. Think about how he's feeling at this moment. Here comes Esau with his 400 men. So... Jacob divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. We see again his priorities. Mm -hmm. He himself, though, went on ahead. He went on ahead, and he bowed down to the ground. He's no longer at the back of the line. He moves on ahead, bows down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. Let's read this together. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. In our story last week about Abraham and Isaac, Every excruciating step, Abraham took up that mountain. He wondered if the day would end in bloodshed. With each step, Jacob got closer to Esau. He feared that he, 
he'd see his wife and wives and children slaughtered before his eyes, and then he would be killed as well. Yet as with Abraham's story, God knew that on the other side of the mountain, a ram was making its way up toward the same spot Jacob, I mean Isaac and Abraham were that day. So also, God knew not only what was going on in Jacob's heart, but also what was going on in Esau's heart and in his life. God, see, friends, God didn't leave Esau in order to go with Jacob up north 20 years ago. No, God was with both of them and is big enough to have blessed both of them with family and love and good things, despite the tricksters within and among them. Notice that rather than hide behind at the back again, which had been his plan all along, Jacob goes out in front of him. And he has wrestled with God. Because he has wrestled with God, he has rumbled with his own worst demons of fear and unworthiness, and he has been given a new name and a new blessing. This time, not from dad, but from God. He has also been given a limp. So he is both vulnerability and courage. Struggle and strength. Peter Enns writes this, After their reunion, Jacob practically begs Esau to accept the gift of livestock that was brought to him. The Hebrew word for gift used here is the same word used earlier for the blessing stolen by Jacob in the beginning of the story. So to tie up the loose ends... In a symbolic gesture, Jacob offers back to his brother the blessing that is properly his. That is, out of the blessing he received from God, Jacob now returns that blessing to his brother. I love this story. This is a story that shapes us as the children of Abraham today because it invites us to be people who wrestle with God. If you ever hear somebody say, well, I can't, you know, I just have to take it on faith. I can't ask questions. I can't argue with this. I can't wrestle. You say, you know, do you know that story about Jacob wrestling with God by the river? God is big enough to handle our questions and our wrestlings and our struggles. And God, I think this story invites us to wrestle with our own stories of fear, of anxiety, of guilt, of sorrow. And invite us to be people who come out stronger for having been face-to-face with God and with ourselves. For anyone today who is struggling in their spirit, who needs a word this morning, that God meets you in your struggle and wrestles with you, I hope you hear God speaking to your heart this morning. I also don't want us to miss that this wrestling match is given to us as the spiritual moment in a as a as the pivotal moment. Sorry, the pivotal moment in a reconciliation story. The repairing of relationship between two people, between two nations, and it comes only after the struggle. I believe this is a word to anyone involved in the hard work the heart work of reconciliation. Maybe for you that's with family or with a friend or that neighbor. (laughs) Or maybe it's in the deep work of equity and justice that we've got to come to the river and wrestle with God and our own stuff in order to reconcile with people we have wronged. In each small step that I've been a part of in working toward reconciliation in this community, I have met people in the LGBT community, in the Suquamish tribe, in the Japanese American community, and the black community. And I have met people, I have met people in each of those spaces 
who have made their way to the river as they have walked through their own stories. And I see how the creator has been at work in their lives as well to bring us all together for conversation, for healing, for repair. Even at times offering reparations of real and transforming value. The call and promise of God that God gave to Abraham and all his descendants was to be a blessing to the world, to all nations, to the glory of God and for the healing of the world. Amen.